to Wasimetrix. My name is Luni and today we're doing your exam guide for English. All you need to do to send your questions and comments through to us is follow Wasimetrix on all our social media platforms as well as our WhatsApp line. All of the details are on the screen. We also have a cool competition going on for you guys so please stay tuned to get all of those details later on in the show. I've got Nicolene, our awesome sign language interpreter, as well as Seema, our teacher. Thank you so much, guys, and over to you. Thanks, Looney. Hi, guys, and welcome to the English First Edition Language Show. Today, we're focusing on paper three, and we're going to look at the exam guidelines and look at notes and how to answer a few questions and some important tips. So let's get to it. Okay. So what does paper three look like? Paper 3, as you all know, is 100 marks and it is a two and a half hour paper with three questions, with three sections. So we're going to go into a little bit of finer detail and let you know exactly what it is to expect in paper 3 in terms of the structure of the paper. Okay, so section A, which is question 1. In question 1, you will have to write an essay, which is just one question, you will be provided with Many questions based on essay type writing, your, your total for this section is 50 marks and it, it would be allocated 80 minutes if you manage your time effectively. Then we go to question 2 which is part of section B and this is your longer transactional writing. Here again you only need to answer one question, it's 30 marks for this section and 40 minutes if you manage your time appropriately. Section C is question three. It's your shorter transactional writing text. You only answer one question again. 20 marks allocated to the one question, 30 minutes for this section. If you allocate your time properly, we will obviously get the two and a half hours for this paper. Let's look at the tips for paper three. In, in paper three, we need to ensure we plan on how to, and how we use our 10 minutes reading time Remember at the beginning of the exam, you are allocated a 10 minute reading time. So you need to utilize this reading time to go through the paper and basically read through the instructions and the guides and, the, and basically the information that guides you as to what is in the paper and how many questions you need to answer. Remember, you only need to answer three questions for this paper, one from each section and that is what your reading time is all about. It allows you some time to familiarize yourself with the paper before you get into the paper itself. So the 10 minute reading time is very important. So it's also very important to read the instructions. Okay, And this is found on page 2 of the question paper. Number your answer exactly as the questions are numbered in the question paper. This is very, very important. Remember, question one will start with 1.1 and go on to maybe 1.5 or 1.6. And thereafter, we have our visuals. It could go on to 1.6.1. So you need to ensure when you are answering or you decide to choose which question you plan on answering, you number your answer correctly. So if you decide to answer the question 1.5, start off with your planning indicating it's question 1.5 and thereafter, the person marking your script will actually know which question you chose to answer if you do not choose to rewrite the question. So let's go on. This is a creative writing paper that requires a creative response. Okay? You must plan. It is very, very important. You need to create a mind map or a diagram or a flowchart or keywords that allows the person marking your script to see that some sort of planning was done. You need to edit and proofread your work. The plan must appear before each text. Right? So we must put the cart before the horse. Okay? Basically, when we write an essay, we need to plan. And the plan needs to be done in such a way where you can either draw a little spider diagram or mind map or whatever you've done in school. Even if you decide to write out paragraph one, and list the key ideas per paragraph just so that you basically show the person marking your essay that you put some thought into this process and you managed to create some sort of plan before you started actually getting creative in writing the actual response. Okay, so all planning must be clearly indicated. Okay, this is very, very important. 
Um, you are encouraged to strike off your plans and your drafts so that the person marking your script knows which is the final piece that will be marked for the assessment for the essay writing section and for the transactional longer and shorter sections. Okay, so let's go on. So each response needs a suitable text or heading. Sometimes we have a question that may not necessarily have a title. You may be required to put in a title of your own choice. This will not be included in your word count, but it also gives some direction to the marker as to what your essay is all about. But remember, it shouldn't deviate from the actual question in the question paper. Okay, so again, it's exam practice, practice, practice. That's the only way we're going to get familiar with this paper. Ensure you work through previous exam papers so that you are aware of the types of questions that we've asked. Um, this will also help you to get a feel of how the papers are presented and help you manage your time. So, let's look at section A, which is your essay questions, right? In section A, you are required to write an essay of between 200 and 300 words in length on one of the following topics. So this is an instruction taken directly from the past year question papers that we've had for paper three, English, first additional language, where you have to write an essay of 250 to 300 words, in which obviously you would have to write a creative response to one of the questions provided. You need to ensure you choose a question that you can relate to, a question that you can obviously write on. 250 to 300 words is a lot of writing but you need to manage yourself and make sure you have different ideas, you have different scenarios, you, have the, you shouldn't be repetitive in what you are saying, especially in a creative response, because then it becomes very dull and boring. Okay, so write down the number and the title of the topic or the essay that you have chosen. Then we go on to the generic type of essays. This is something we've done during class time, We've done the narrative essay, the descriptive essay, reflective essay, discursive essay, and argumentative essay. Now, in our exam papers, you are not restricted to write a specific type of essay. The, the people that set the exam papers just basically give you an exam question paper with either quotations or statements or pictures, visual stimuli, so that you can respond to them. So you need to ensure that the way in which you decide to respond to your essay is one of the following that we've mentioned now, so that you actually decide whether you are narrating a story or you're reflecting on an incident that has happened that can link with one of the topics you have, or whether it's a discursive or an argumentative essay, whether we're looking at things like um, you know, issues, societal issues for or, or against it. You can either go discursive or argumentative, but we'll speak a little more about it just now. But you need to ensure that all your essays are descriptive because remember you are being creative. So descriptive writing means that you need to ensure that you are able to describe things when you are writing. Be a bit creative. That's what creative writing is all about. If you are talking about bees, describe the bees. You know, we've done things like collective nouns when we were in primary school. We, we said a swarm of bees. If you discuss being attacked by bees in your essay, you could say, I was attacked by a swarm of bees. So you're being creative, you're using all your knowledge of language, and you are being descriptive. So the person reading your essay knows that you weren't attacked by one bee, you were attacked by many bees, but you did it in a creative way. And also remember, we use figurative language, we use our uh, metaphors and similes to describe things. As much as it may sound silly, we could say that the window laughed at us, although it may seem a bit much. But in the context of what you're writing, it may fit in and be appropriate. So let's go on. There are other types where we get the quotations and the visual stimuli. This is very, very important to look at. If you do not understand what a quotation is actually saying in a question paper, I discourage you from actually attempting that as a question. If you know exactly what the quotation is saying and you fully understand it and you can relate to the quotation, then by all means, go ahead and answer that question. The visual stimuli are pictures that are usually provided in the paper, and these visual stimuli that are provided usually are pictures that could sort of create some sort of emotion in you, 
or obviously attract you to that visually because you can relate to it in some way, where you would be expected to obviously now um, write an essay based on what you see. So you need to actually look at the bigger picture. You must make sure that you focus on what is foregrounded in the picture so that you make sure you answer the picture. Remember, your essay type questions are marked with a rubric and most of the marks go to the content. So the content is based on what you see. So make sure you don't go into the finer detail of the picture and you focus on the, what is sticking out the most in the picture, okay? So we will look at a few examples as we go along so that you are aware of what it is we are speaking about. So let's go on. So now your essay structure, you guys know this by now, back and forth. Your essay must start with an introduction, it has a body and it has a conclusion. Please do not indicate these as headings in your final essay. It is not required. Remember, the person reading your essay is an experienced teacher, so the teacher is well aware that you should have an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. So there's no need for headings in an essay. It's actually not regarded, it's not required at all. Okay, so your introduction is usually your first paragraph, and it should usually introdu introduce the reader, who is the marker, as to what it is you are writing about. You should give them some sort of insight as to what it is you are focusing on or what your creative piece is basically going to discuss going forward. Your body of your essay should focus on key issues linking to your topic and obviously each paragraph should have a separate idea or a new idea or at least two ideas to make sure that it is a very comprehensive, well-written piece. You must make sure you do not repeat your ideas. When you start repeating your ideas, your marks start going down. Remember, it sh there should not be any repetition. Repetitiveness actually makes it sound very boring. So if you're going to talk about a dog, for example, I'm going to use a very simple example, and the dog is obviously black in color. In your first, is in your first paragraph, in your body, you decide to say, right, the dog is black in color, and you go on talking about the dog's fur being black in color. And then the second paragraph, you get stuck and you say, okay, the second paragraph of your body, you decide to go and say, the dog is dark in color. So we're basically saying the same thing in a different way, but it's obviously not giving us any new information. So we need to make sure our ideas are original. And that is the thing, when we pick a topic, we must make sure that the topic that we pick is something that we can speak about. This is why your plan is very important, because your plan gives you an idea if you are able to come up with different topics within the essay to discuss to ensure that you are not repeating the ideas all the time and you are discussing different issues or different insights or different um, incidents if it's a narrative essay for that regard. So let's go on. Narrative writing or essay type writing. Okay, so in a narrative question we tell a story. So again you need your little title there. Remember capital letters or Sentences should start with a capital letter, end with a full stop, or the relevant punctuation, an exclamation mark or a question mark. Remember the sentence types. Keep the sentences simple. Remember you need a topic sentence for each paragraph. Remember there needs to be paragraphs with main ideas, the beginning, the middle, and the end. Our studies should have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the event should be chronological meaning it should have some sort of order. We shouldn't be jumping all around the essay and going back, unless we are a good writer and we're able to go back and forth and nostalgic and have those type of viewpoints, then it's different. So the writing process as well is very, very important and there's no such thing as final drafts. We must have a final piece or a final essay. Okay, so let's go on. Let's look at the discursive essay, right? There's a reason I've selected the discursive and the argumentative essay as topics to discuss. It's because they are very similar, but not entirely so. So the discursive essay, very quickly, is an essay in which you could have an argument of sorts, but you speak for and against the topic. So basically, in a discursive essay, you're going to look at things that go for the topic, which are in agreement with the topic, and also things that go against the topic. So it could be something like making schools 100% technologically advanced and doing away with paper and 
there are, you could look at a topic like that and obviously look at the pros and the cons. You could look at what is actually going to work when we do something like that and also what, has, what is the downside of doing something like that. So the discursive essay is actually quite a nice essay to write where it gives you a better chance of getting your 250 to 300 words, especially if you get stuck, uh, where you speak about the for and against the topic. So make sure when you're planning, you either start with against or for, and in your conclusion, you need to take a stance and decide whether you are for or against the topic. But your essay needs to give a balanced view of the pros and the cons of the topic. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly whiz through this. Um, this essay is a balanced, objective examination of a subject, and it's, bit, it's more formal, right? So your content, your essay, your structure style must be formal, um, and the essay should present both sides, as I've indicated, and support the facts and research. Okay, so let's look at the argumentative essay. Now, the argumentative essay is a little bit different from the discursive essay. Here, you, don't, you, you do not have a choice. You are arguing either for or against a topic. So it means you take a stand and you go with it. You, as soon as you start jumping between the pros and cons, it means you are falling into a discursive category. So you need to make sure that you decide in an argumentative essay, if you decide to attempt an argumentative essay, that you either go for the topic or, ag or against the topic and your essay is consistent with that mindset. Okay, so let's quickly look at what we have here. So it clearly attempts to clearly present a strong position, right? So you're either for or against the topic and it follows a general format. The purpose is both to educate and persuade the reader on a particular point of view. I would encourage you to go the discursive route as then it gives you a platform to write on the pros and cons. So that's all we have for the first session today and then we will continue after the break. Thank you, Seema. Matrix, let's take a quick break and we'll see you straight after this. Welcome back from the break, Matrix. If you've just joined us, we are doing your exam guide to help with the upcoming exams. If you're constantly running out of data, then this next competition is just for you. Wazamatrix is bringing you the hashtag Wazawinner competition, where two lucky metrics stand a chance to win two gigs of data. All you need to do to enter is head on over to our Facebook page and all of the details will be there. Thank you so much, Seema, and over to you. Thanks, Ludi, and welcome back, guys. Let's go on with transactional writing. We're looking at the longer transactional writing, so let's get to it. So, the expectations for the longer transactional writing, again, the body of your response should be 120 to 150 words in length. This is the minimum and the maximum number of words of the length of the response. Write down the number again. Remember, you have a choice. It's section B, so it will be question 2.1 or 2.2 or 2.3. And thereafter, you need a little heading if need be, but that heading should be included in your plans. Okay, and then you need to pay attention to format, language, and register in this section. It's very, very important, and we'll speak about that a little more now. Okay, so the types of questions you'll find in, sec in section B, we'll start off with the friendly letter. We all know what the friendly letter is all about. Um, in this day and age, we are more familiar with our SMS texts and our blogs and uh, emails. That's the faster way of doing things, but in the exams, we still do the friendly letters. So let's go on and look at the different types of letters that we also get over and above the friendly letters. Okay, so we have the formal letter, and the formal letter is made up of different types of formal letters. You have a letter of request, where you could send a letter of request to a company requesting more information. You have a letter of application. It could be a letter accompanying your CV. You have a business letter, a formal business letter that you would write from one company to another company, a letter of complaint. I know you guys love this letter. The letter of complaint is obviously about a product or a service that you were dissatisfied with. It could range from a, a whole lot of things, a letter of complaint, but always remember the tone in a formal letter is formal. Okay. 
Then a letter of sympathy, you could write a formal letter of sympathy to a work colleague who has lost somebody that has passed on, a letter of congratulations. So a letter of congratulations is also a formal letter where you could congratulate somebody on their promotion. And then finally, a letter of thanks. In a corporate environment, you could thank a company or a person that you've worked with for their um, intervention in whatever it is that you may have been involved in. Then you get the formal or the informal letter to the press. Um, that depends on the type of question you are responding to and our favorite obituary where we have to write a little piece about somebody that has passed on. We will speak a little bit more about this topic here going forward. You also have reviews, okay? Remember it's 120 to 150 words for this section. You have formal and informal reports. This is something you've possibly covered in your classroom. And then you also have the newspaper article as well as the magazine article. And the formats are more or less similar, but there are slight differences in the format. And then, don't forget, you have your curriculum vitae, which we call the CV, and a covering letter. The covering letter may differ from the letter of application. So let's have a little discussion about this. The letter of application is actually a an application for a job, okay? So it could mean that you would obviously indicate what are the specifics that you are looking into in terms of that application. A covering letter to a CV would be a letter indicating how you match the profile of a job that you are applying for. So we need to be very careful about how we manage those two letters. Remember, the tone is formal, the register is formal, and we need to make sure that we speak in a formal way with respect. Okay, so let's go on. We look at the next combo that we do um, in this section, which is the agenda and the minutes of a meeting. Remember, the focus would be on the minutes of the meeting in terms of the assessment, but we can't do that without a proposed agenda. So these are normally asked as a combo. So even with the CV and the covering letter and the agenda and the minutes of the meeting, both sections need to be done as they can't be done in, without the other or your question paper may give you the agenda and ask you to write the minutes of the meeting or they may ask you to give you a, um, a brief CV template and ask you to populate it for a CV and thereafter write your covering letter to obviously apply for a post that will be possibly part of your question. So these questions are also available and it does take a lot of time in thinking about it so you need to make sure when you decide to answer these questions you ensure that you get straight to the point. Remember again it's formal content and register so you need to make sure the language is formal and the tone is formal. Okay so let's go on. Then we also have our famous dialogue. A dialogue, again, is between two people. Then the written interview. Remember, the word written is key here because it's obviously not a spoken interview, but it's a written interview. And then the written formal and informal speech, which is also a very popular topic in our papers. So we need to make sure that we are aware of the formats of these and how we need to actually address it when we are attempting a question of this nature. Okay, so we're going to look at the obituary today. And the obituary is, a, is a one of the questions that usually are very popular in our paper threes. If you go through our past two papers for English first additional language, you will notice that the obituary um, comes up quite often as a choice question. And it's actually not a very difficult question to answer if you know the format and you know the requirements for an obituary. So the obituary is actually uh, a very sad piece of writing, but again, the tone and register is formal. It's very important that when we are writing about a deceased individual, that we are respectful to the family and the deceased individual, but we will look at our notes so that we are more accurate about what is the expectation for an obituary. Okay, so tips on writing an obituary. Obituaries are life stories, accomplishments, and public notifications about a recently deceased person or people and they may have several different versions. So there isn't one set version, it also depends on what our question is asking. Okay, so um, while a newspaper obituary might be short and focused on survivors and funeral service information, 
The obituary in a funeral program can be a longer piece and obviously tell you more details about the person. Now remember, we are writing a longer transactional text or piece and we are expected to write 120 to 150 words. So naturally, our obituary will have to include certain information to ensure that we are assessed accurately and we meet the requirements of our rubric that we use for the assessment. So we need to make sure we look at the different things. So we're going to go on now and look at the different criteria or the different points that we need to remember when we are writing an obituary. Okay. So, <clears throat> it is the centerpiece of the funeral program which can serve as a very informative keepsake about a person's life. That's very, very important. Remember, the focus of the obituary is obviously the deceased and also about the final services. So the funeral arrangements could go in there as well. Then, so let's go on to look at exactly what must be included in an obituary. The date and the location of birth, that's very important. We have to give some sort of background about the deceased. The date and the cause of death, you must just be careful. Sometimes your question may include some sort of um, description of the death. Then the full names of the spouses and the children and any other survivors. So maybe it was an elderly person who had grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So obviously that would also be included in an obituary. Thereafter, we look at details about the education. Um, the high school education is important. The person could have gone on to get a diploma or degrees later on in life. Um, and where and w in what year. It's also very, very important to have timelines as to when these qualifications were achieved. And then if we go on, we look at details about work. Okay? You, do, you don't need to write a full resume. Remember, we're not writing a CV here or a covering letter. We're writing details about a deceased individual, right? So um, you need to write the full names of your loved ones, obviously their careers, and you also need to make the general outlines of where he worked. This is basically repeating what I said before and what he did and for how long. It's very, very important also to look at what the question is asking you. If the question gives you some sort of uh, context, you need to include that in your answer so that you don't deviate from the content that's expected in the obituary. So please read your questions very carefully and make sure when you're done with your obituary and you read it out to yourself, you ensure that you answered the question. That's very, very important. So make sure when you are finally done with your obituary, you go back to the question, read the question again, and make sure that you have answered the question. Okay, so then we go on. Um, the person could be involved in clubs and organizations that were important to the loved ones. For example, he or she could be in, in the local sports team. It could be a religious organization. It could be a range of things that could be out of their professional environment. It could be a community-based project. It could be anything that obviously appealed to the deceased individual that obviously he did and was obviously recognized for. Then we can go on to look at any special achievements, okay? So he could have served in the military. That's very rare, but please don't put everybody in the military now. Um, did your loved one win any prizes? He could have won, or maybe the person was a previous Miss South Africa candidate. You never know. Published a book, somebody famous, okay? And hold public office, somebody that you knew that was obviously a very popular person. You will need to correct the correct names, okay? So the titles will be, is it Mr., Miss, Doctor? Um, and the years for any of these achievements, right? It's very, very important that our CVs have a, our, um, sorry, obituaries have a timeline. So we're able to see how the, the life of the deceased individual actually unfolded, okay? So details about the funeral arrangements also need to be included and requests about flowers or donations also need to be included. Now I'm just going to very quickly speak about this. It's very, very important to remember the tone and the register again is formal. We are dealing with people who are obviously very sad and depressed and have lost a loved one. So we need to make sure 
that the obituary is not going to start making claims. So we can't force people to give us donations. You have to very tactfully say that donations, people who want to make donations or whatever to the family or, or for whatever reason, can obviously do it a certain way and then you can recommend a person or give them details of phone number or something of a person that they can contact. If people are um, allowed to bring through fun uh, flower arrangements for the funeral, you also need to include details of that in the obituary so people reading the obituary towards the end are able to understand how the arrangements for the funeral actually work. So that will assist with the crowd. Remember, it, although this is a creative piece and it's not necessarily done for a real individual that has deceased, remember you need to ensure that it has that element of reality in it so that the, the reader reading the obituary can understand that you are fully aware of what goes into an obituary. Okay, so, okay, that's all of the longer transactional writing pieces. I'm going to hand over to Looney for a break again. Thank you, Sima. Matrix, we are going to take a break. Don't forget to enter the competition and send us any questions and comments you may have. And we'll see you straight after this. Welcome back from the break, Matrix. I hope you guys are still enjoying the show. Thank you so much, Sima, and over to you. Thanks, Luni. And now we're going to look at section C, which is your shorter transactional writing. And we're going to look at the different pieces and obviously the requirements for the shorter transactional text. So let's get to it. Okay, so the expectations, again, remember the body of your response. It needs to be 80 to 100 words in length. That's your minimum and maximum there. You need to write down the number again. Remember, you'll have a choice of questions, so it's either 3.1 or 3.2 or 3.3. And remember the heading. I would prefer you write the heading in your plans. And also, again, remember attention to the format, language, and register, which is very, very important. These are instructions taken from your question paper. So let's look at the types of questions you would get for the shorter transactional writing, the advertisement, Remember, you would need to create an advertisement that gives you some sort of question based on it. Remember, you only get marks for the actual words and not the pictures. So make sure you focus on the content of the advertisement. Then you have the invitation card. You people are familiar with the invitation card. It's something that you actually do. Um, again, remember, it's 80 to 100 words. Okay, So we must never forget that. And we are looking at words. Okay. So it doesn't matter how creative you get with your invitation card and how beautiful it looks, the focus is actually on the content. Then a flyer, a flyer could, use, could be used to sell a service or whatever it is, or focus or educate or advertise. So you need to ensure as well, again, your focus is on the number of words used so that we don't lose sight of the content. It's very nice and well to draw a beautiful flyer, but it's also you must ensure that the content is there. Remember, you have to answer the question that's provided. Then the poster follows the same route. And then you have your diary entries. It's very, very important to date your diary entries and ensure that the different entries have a different focus. But again, we must make sure that we are answering the question. Okay. Then we have the postcard. Again, remember the format of the postcard. We look at the content. We need to ensure we answer the question provided, and we must make sure that we focus on um, and include things that are requested by the actual question. Then there are instructions. Obviously, you will be given a scenario, and you would uh, be asked to create instructions based on that. With this question here, it should actually be very, very important to look at the actual instructions given for this question. So you need to either list the instructions or um, create some sort of summary type of question where you uh, response where you basically answer the question then there are directions okay so today we're going to look at directions and how we go about giving directions in a response to a shorter transactional text so here we have um, the verbs that we use and prepositions of places when we are giving directions okay so here, the verbs we would use turn left 
obviously, you, if you're giving a person directions from your school to your home, you need to start somewhere. So if they're starting at the gate, they obviously need to either go straight, turn left, or turn right, okay? So the, those are the verbs you would use to indicate direction. So you turn left, turn right, go straight ahead as I've indicated, or you can go past. Now here you would obviously go past a landmark, it could be a school, it could be a church, it could be the local KFC. So you need to make sure you do include landmarks in your response. You could cross over a four-way crossing, you could cross over a, robo, a robot. So you need to, this, or a traffic light, you need to ensure you make that type of decision when you are including directions. Remember, directions is basically how you give a person directions from one place to another. So a good activity for you before you actually attempt a question on directions is if you have a GPS or if you have a, um, an app on your phone that guides you through, um, you know, to give you directions from one place to another place, you could actually listen in on how the apps or the actual people speaking on those apps guide you from one place to another place. You will see sometimes it very clearly tells you turn left, turn right. Sometimes it even tells you to keep in a certain lane for 200 meters because a turn or an off ramp is coming up. You could use all of that in your response for directions. You could also remember to use street names. It's very, very important that we use street names. Street signs are also necessary. Also remember landmarks, as I indicated, whether it's a church or a school or a shop, a shopping center. It could be anything. Um, it's very, very important. You could say you turn left after the shop right. It could be anything. So you need to ensure that when you are giving directions, you use your landmarks, you mention street names, you mention distances, and you use the proper verbs. So if it's turn left, into which street or turn right into which street drive for how many meters or kilometers before you turn left remember we have circles in our drive throughs these days so make sure if you decide to use a circle you need to indicate which exit within that circle that you will be taking obviously if you're taking the first exit you will say keep left and take the first exit in the circle or keep left and take the second exit and obviously every time you take an exit or a turn it's very very important to mention the name of the street okay so let's go on let's look at prepositions the prepositions that we would use um, at the corner of or next to remember these little um, diagrams here actually give you some sort of idea as to what we're talking about so a is at the corner of there and then next to so A is next to B. Can you see that? And then opposite. You see, if this is the street, A is opposite B. And then between. B is in between A and C. So it's very, very important that we, we are using verbs and prepositions for directions. We use the accurate verbs and positions. And as I've indicated, we need to ensure we actually name our landmarks and we use the street names that are provided. Also, mileage is very, very important, so you need to indicate how many meters, how many kilometers. Remember, it's a creative response, so nobody's going to go and look at the measurements. So you can either use 200 meters, turn left into Alpha Street, and that's perfectly acceptable, and then you can say drive on for another kilometer, and you will pass so many landmarks. Obviously, you need to indicate the landmarks so that the person actually taking those directions is able to get to where they need to go to. So let's go on. Now, we're going to look at prepositions and directions. Again, we look at on. The house is on whichever street, the name of the street. Across from, so you could say the house is across from the school in front. Next to, okay. Here you can say that uh, your house is next to, this could have been um, the local spa, and then behind. You see, it could mean that you need to go in a little further and the place that you are looking for is behind the place in front. Between again is between two places. You can either identify these two places uh, and say that the place that you're obviously going to is in between there. And then 
near is also another nice preposition to use, um, but it doesn't give you a, a lot of um, uh, distance as such. You could say that your house is near the local park, um, you know, so that it gives somebody that's trying to get to you some sort of uh, grounding as to where the place may be. Then, if we look at tips for um, transactional, shorter transactional writing, we need to ensure that we use accurate and explicit vocabulary. Remember, again, the shorter transactional piece that you would attempt is for formal writing. So you need to ensure that your tone and your register throughout your formal writing pieces are formal. You need to also ensure that you plan before you start writing. It's very, very important to plan because when you plan, you actually decide whether or not you are able to maintain a piece for 80 to 100 words. So you need to ensure that you plan um, correctly so that we actually ensure that you have all the things. Like when you're planning for directions, for example, you need to ensure that you have maybe at least three landmarks. So you need to decide which three landmarks you're going to include. Are you including a school? Are you including the local church? Are you including a local park? It could be a local spa. You know, there's a range of things that you can include as landmarks. And then street names. It will also be nice in your planning to write down a list of street names that you would like to include. Also ensure that the spelling is accurate and we know how to use our proper nouns when we are naming streets. And it's also very, very important to know the spelling of meter and kilometer so that when we are giving distances, we don't get caught up in the wrong spelling of these words. Okay, so go straight ahead is a direction. Turn back. This is obviously if you go into the wrong direction or go back. Then turn left or right. Okay. Include the street names. This is something that I've said repeatedly. It's very, very important that we include the street names. And go along is also another term that we could use. And then also cross over. Remember, we've mentioned that before. So, now if we use accurate and explicit vocabulary for directions, okay, you take the first road on the right and give it the name of the street, okay. Then it's on the right. If we're looking for a specific building, we need to indicate where it can be found. Go past. Here again, landmarks are very, very important and should be included. And then the easiest way is to. This is basically saying to a person that although there are many routes, the easiest way is this way or the best way to is this way. And then, you know, on the corner off. So these are the terms that we would use when we are giving directions, which is very, very important to understand and also to ensure that we get the spelling right because spelling is also assessed in this paper. Okay, so we don't want to end up looking like this. Okay, we need to ensure that we stay cool and calm throughout um, the writing of paper three. You need to ensure that you use words that you can spell. You need to also ensure that you are familiar with the formats and whatever is needed for this paper. We have given you a list of um, transactional texts, essay types, and all of that that you can look through and revise through if your teacher has given you notes on that so that you are well prepared for this paper. It's very, very important to study for this paper. It may be a creative writing paper, but it is important for you to go back and look at formats and structure and also read. Reading basically improves your knowledge of what's happening around you. It gives you more uh, information. It actually adds to your creativity because now you have knowledge about something you didn't know before. Okay, so please don't end up like the guy in the picture because we don't want you to get stressed out about paper three. Okay, so finally, don't forget, manage your time effectively. Remember, this is a two and a half hour paper and you have three questions. So please make sure you manage your time effectively. Utilize your 10 minutes reading time, which is very, very important, and that's right at the beginning of your exam paper. Your school should allow you 10 minutes to read before the paper starts. And it is very, very important to read all questions before you make a choice, okay? And you need to read your questions at least two to three times for a better understanding before rushing to answer. It's very, very important that we make sure we make the right choices because time is restricted. 
Okay? So again, we need to practice, practice, practice and ensure that you work through previous papers. Keep calm and try your best. Ensure um, you answer only three questions for this paper. Also remember, you only need to answer three questions. So you need to make sure the first time around that you choose the right question. Because we don't want you to start all over again and then that's just a waste of time. Also remember, you need to do your planning. Thereafter, you need to write out a draft copy of your essay. Edit that draft into your final piece. There is no need for you to rewrite a final piece. That will just eat into your time. And it will obviously, you will run out of time and you won't be able to cover section C, which is the shorter transactional text, which is actually one of the easier texts to get to. So please manage your time effectively. Do not write out a draft and rewrite it as a final piece. And make sure you plan effectively. If you plan effectively, there's no need for you to write a draft response to the question you are asking. So all the best, guys. And that's all I have for you for paper three. I wish you all the best for the exam. And back to Looney. Thank you, Sima. Matrix, I also hope that you use all of our study resources to help you prepare. And if you have any questions, again, you are welcome to send them through. Congratulations to all of our competition winners who will be announced on Facebook after the show. For our schedule, visit www.wasamatrix.co.za. And if you missed any of our lessons, they are available on our YouTube channel. From me, Looney, Sima, and Nicolene, thank you and goodbye.